write about food for the New York Times, and yet I was, I was kind of, frankly, a little ashamed when I saw this film, A Place at the Table, to realize how little I knew about the hunger crisis in America and how much I needed to catch up on. Um, it's, it's the kind of issue that remains invisible for a lot of us. It could be happening in our own neighborhoods, as the film taught me, and we don't see it. So I wanted to start by asking you guys why that is. Why does it remain this central issue in American life that's somehow not visible? One of the reasons why it's invisible is because we've attached a stigma to it. Uh, we live in a moment in time when there's a big culture of blame and that has managed to supplant real dialogue around responsibility and how we can figure out solutions. Um, because we spend a lot of our energy, and I think the, the media unfortunately sometimes assists in this, blaming people for a condition that they often had nothing to do with bringing about, um, it encourages people to stay in the shadows, to not to, not to uh, come out with their situation and talk about it. Um, and we also have a, a sort of cherished American myth that we pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and if we make it, we make it on our own. And the flip of that is if we're somehow not making it, well, we must have done something wrong. Mm. And if anything, I'm hoping this film manages to, um, we're hoping that this film really manages to, to flip that around a little bit, show that at times the game's a bit fixed and some people are really doing their share to contribute to the, the social contract and they're still not able to feed their families. I think, I think we're also conditioned to think in, of hunger in terms of third world hunger. Uh, we know what that looks like, we know what famine victims look like, um, but we don't know uh, what sort of the average American walking around looks like. In fact, one in six Americans are food insecure. So if you're on the subway, a crowded subway, you can rest assured that there are, are people that are, are uh, having issues with, with food insecurity. And so it, we're, it's just the conditioning. And I think what we're trying to do in the film is show that you have policemen that are, that are, are food insecure, uh, kids, uh, young mothers, teachers. Um, and so it, it looks very different than what we're used to, to sort of identifying with, with hunger. I suspect for a lot of you there was like an epiphany. There was a moment when suddenly you did see it. Jeff, you've been passionate about this issue mm -hmm. for decades now. Was there a moment that transformed you personally? Well, I've been uh, involved with uh, the hunger issue for about 30 years. It started sure. uh, with world hunger. Uh, because here in our country we had, uh, you know, our safety nets were in place. And then uh, I guess it was right around the time when uh, ketchup became a vegetable, well, uh -huh. about 20, <laughs> 20 years ago or something. And uh, the holes in our safety nets started to appear. And so uh, my organization, the End Hunger Network, we shifted our focus to uh, hunger here uh, in America. And about three years ago, um, I uh, hooked up with Billy's organization, Share Our Strength, and their wonderful campaign called No Kid Hungry, uh, that, as Billy was saying, utilizing those government funds, it's over a billion dollars, I think, that is available to states to uh, make sure that the kids um, have school breakfast and lunch and, and summer programs, but a lot of the governors aren't, aren't, aren't aware that this money is available, and so the kids don't have access to this, this food. When we started to meet, you know, many of the 50 million people who are experiencing this hunger and food insecurity, um, it just, it, it's, it was really troubling. Um, we spent time with these 40 women from North Philly who had gathered together to join this group um, called Witnesses to Hunger and to sit in the room with them and, and go home with them and experience, um, even for a day, what they're going through every single day trying to put food on the table is deeply uns unsettling. And um, it certainly felt like not enough people know about this. And, um, you know, we have the skills, I, I hope, um, you know, to tell this story in a cinematic way and hopefully reach a lot of people and, uh, you know, make this invisible problem visible. Well, it seems like one of the revelations for me watching the film was, you know, one way in which someone might be able to dismiss this or just fail to see it has to do with obesity. You know, obesity is um, a problem in this country and it might lead some people to think, well, the people are getting enough calories, aren't they? Um, but in fact, as we learned from the film, obesity and um, food insecurity are twinned. Um, so could you talk a little bit about, about why that is? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, it's, it's true that most people have 
these preconceptions about why people are obese and, and the decisions that they're making and the personal responsibility um, and what role that plays in it. But we've, what we found, and in particular we, we chose to film in Mississippi because it was a state that held the distinction of being the highest ranked in food insecurity and also the highest ranked in obesity. So there you have it. And um, you know there are just too many people in this country who don't have access to healthy foods or have, have, have the, you know, the income to afford f foods if they do have access. And so that contributes to a real um, problem of, of, of you know, a, a crisis in obesity that we all know about, but it's really a hunger and malnutrition and obesity crisis that the country is dealing with right well, now. Well, that's, that was so crucial to the film. And again, another eye-opening aspect for me was food stamps, it's sort of government assistance. We're talking about people living on, am I, do I have the, the number right, like $3 a day in terms of the, the allotment? The average now, I think, is just over, nationwide average is just over $4 a day. So in some parts of the country, yes, $3, some 5 but it averages at around $4 a day. So what can you get with that? Well, you know, a lot of chips. A lot of chips, uh, yeah. Some soda. You know, I, I think when you look at, you hear $3 a day, and of, of course it's, it's a small amount of money, and then you've got to ask yourself, why is it $3 a day? And, and the government uses something called the Thrifty Food Plan to, to calculate how much money you get uh, to, to sort of supplement your, your income. And it also assumes that um, the person who uh, receives a benefit, they have 13 hours a week to cook, where the average person actually cooks about four and a half hours um, a week. They also assume that there are only certain things you can buy. For instance, the only fish that they sort of look at the plan and say, well, fish, that's tuna in a can. Hmm. That that's, you know, doesn't include fresh stuff. Um, it also um, assumes that there's absolutely no waste. So 100% of everything you buy is used, which is, is it's, it, it's, not, it's not reality. It doesn't happen. So what happens in the classroom when kids aren't getting the nutrition they need? Well, they might present as disciplinary problems. They can't focus. They might have a bad attitude. I know I have a really bad attitude when I'm hungry. Um, you know, and then uh, they, they really can't retain or process information the way a kid who's well nourished can. Um, and it has a social component as well. They're feeling ashamed and humiliated. Uh, I thought the brilliance of the filmmakers was to say this is not just an issue about do you feel bad for hungry kids. This is an issue that affects education. Of course. This is affects our, our, our future economic competitiveness. So I think it enables you to, I hope, create a broader constituency of support for this. Mm -hmm. Uh, issue by showing the ramifications. We, we've just uh, recently been involved in a study that Deloitte, the big consulting firm, did. And they looked at schools that have uh, really uh, almost universal participation in school breakfast. They just looked at breakfast versus schools that don't. Those that do have 17.5 percent higher math scores. Mm. They have 1.5 uh, day longer attendance rates. They have graduation rates that are 20 percent higher. Let's not just feel bad about kids, but to show the direct connection between educational achievement and hunger is, uh, I think it's an eye-opener for people. Why is there resistance to improving school lunches? Why is that such a bureaucratic nightmare? Why does that happen? As a parent, I'd love to know. Well, I mean, I think it largely goes back to what Billy was talking about early, is that the, that the kids who really rely on these school breakfasts and lunches are kids who don't generally have a voice. Mm. And um, so the onus is on us to, to make sure that our politicians recognize the importance of this. And, you know, in the making of this film, we, we, we captured the process of the child nutrition um, reauthorization, as it's called, and it was ultimately um, um, announced as the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. But we watched as what was requested, $10 billion, was whittled down first by the House, then by the Senate, to $4.5 billion, and that's over 10 years. And then ultimately, um, in order to pay for that bill, a deal was made where they would cut food stamps to pay for half of that bill. So I think that shows you what the priorities are in, in Washington and with a lot of these, um, the decision makers. Uh, say further to that, because Christy's exactly right, um, this is aided and abetted by the conversation that's happening right now on the national stage, at, whereas where everything is presented equally as if, well, I don't know how we're going to pay for that. We just don't have the money for pay for that. People, wake up. We're paying for it. We're paying for it, and we're paying way more 
than it would cost to adequately fund school lunches and school breakfasts as an example of one policy that's great. Also fixing and modernizing SNAP or making sure that WIC is adequate to infants and mothers and children. We're paying to not do those to the tune of $167 billion in cost to our economy every year. And believe me, it wouldn't cost, a, it costs a fraction of that to modernize and to um, substantially improve these programs. So we're paying either way. And I would so love if the dialogue around austerity and takers and 47%, I mean, I'm kind of sick to death of it, frankly, because we are paying. It's taxpayer money. It's being spent badly. We're just asking for common sense on this. <laughs>